Hey guys, what's up? It's Coach Carroll. Welcome to another episode of the Sales Factory Podcast. Boy, I got a gym for you all today. I got Jordan Stupar in the building. I know you guys have seen him all over socials. The, the card game that he created for salespeople. We're going to talk about that today. But if you don't know who Jordan Stupar is, let me read you a little, a little bio from this guy. I've known him for years. Uh, Jordan is an entrepreneur, business owner, speaker, and seven-figure sales coach. During his 18-year-long sales career, Jordan was able to become a top 1% income earner and has personally generated over $20 million in sales. Today, Jordan is the CEO of Stupar Enterprises, a highly visible sales training company. I like that highly visible sales training company located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's up there uh, in the cold part of the country with all the good beer. The company's fully staffed and proudly serves over 15,000 sales professionals across 39 countries and hundreds of hundreds of businesses in nearly every industry throughout the USA. Jordan, thank you so much for coming on and spending a little time with my audience today in the sales factory. For sure, man. I'm excited to be here, especially with the title, The Sales Factory. This this seems like my type of show to be on, so I appreciate you having me. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You know, we've got our listeners or anybody from a, a 13-year-old kid that just bought his first lawnmower, starting his first business, to, you know, last week I had somebody on, actually, the podcast right after this. I got a guy that's got a, a, a $40 million book of insurance business, right? And so, um, wide array of listeners, wide array of guests. What I'm most excited about is very seldom do I actually get somebody to come to the sales factory that focuses on sales coaching and sales training. So um, I'm, I don't want to spend a ton of time with just like pleasantries and stuff. I want to hop right into this thing because I know you're a wealth of knowledge, man, and I know I'm going to take some good stuff. Guys, I've got my iPad up and I'm taking notes, so make sure you go to coachcarol.com forward slash podcast. If you're listening to this, you can download the notes that I'm going to take uh, from this session with Jordan. Uh, Jordan, a lot of you, guys, a lot of those guys are going to know you online, right? You you worked with Grant for a long time. Now you're out on your own. You're busting, dude. You're a girl dad. You shared with us. You got another one on the way. You got a lot of life happening, man. Um, talk to us about where Stup- Stupar Enterprises are right now and the crazy growth, man, that I've been able to watch you have for the past several years. It's been awesome, man. Uh, let everybody know kind of what what's going on in your world. Yeah. So I run a sales training company. I still don't really like the name like sales training. It just (laughs) sounds like too much work for the end user, but it is what it is. Um, I help salespeople and uh, sales organizations make more money and get richer by implementing what I like to call micro processes into the sales process. I'm not necessarily ever trying to, you know, tell people that they should follow my exact process or anything. I just like to help figure out where areas of inefficiency are within different organizations or different salespeople. And then I give them some best practices and some things that, again, if they implement it, very, very high probability that those things work to secure more opportunities and help that person make more money. Yeah, man, I love that. You know, uh, oftentimes you hear about sales. It's not a magic bullet, right? It's about 1% better and 2% better. And, hey, I did this little thing, and now my, my close rate went up 3%. You start stacking those wins, and that's when you can really see a difference in business. Um, when you talk about micro processes, let's hop right into this. Like, what's what's maybe one or two things that you see that you're like, man, most of the time when I go into an organization or I work with a sales person, it's, like, blatant. It's, like, this is, like, I, I, like nine times out of ten, I know that I'm going to ask them this question. This is going to be their answer. And this is like one of the first things I can fix. Yep, for sure. So like micro processes can involve themselves from, you know, the sales script that you read to the presentation or the demo that you have when you're uh, formally showing your product or service to um, sending out a proposal to your follow-up process. For those of you that might have a longer sales cycle, a couple of days, couple of weeks, in some cases, a couple months, um, Basically, my, my, my question to you would be, if you know what to do, how much do you know what you should do next? That would be the question. Mm. I've broken my traditional sales approach into always, sometimes, and nevers. You know, there's going to be some questions that some of you guys might ask or a way that you handle an objection or approach that you have to following up or something that just like never works. So like, let's be aware of that. 
And if it has a lower probability of working, drop that into your never category. Like, hey, I am never going to ask this dumb question again or wow. whatever that thing is. Just, just isolate that. Don't do it. Then you have uh, your sometimes is. These are the things that, you know, depending on, you know, uh, where, you know, Coach Carroll is in the country. Maybe I would send this type of follow-up versus something else because, you know, I know where he's located or I understand his belief system or his goals or something. These are kind of the special things that you you do sometimes that, again, with the appropriate uh, customer, with the appropriate size deal or whatever, traditionally would add more value to that person and likely increase the chances of you getting a deal. And then you have uh, your all, always is. And that's where I really like to step in and I really like to give people the, the micro process. For instance, a lot of you guys probably send out some type of, you know, proposal, quote, invoice, something. Whenever I do that and whenever I do that, I always send it out um, to somebody in a message, email, text message, but it's always going to be accompanied by uh, an enthusiastic selfie video. Yep. I'm always going to record something 15, 30 seconds long. Not only am I just going to slide over some proposal to you, but one of my always is, is to grab my phone, you know, shoot a, shoot a video and say, what's up coach Carol. It's Jordan over here down below is where you're going to find that proposal. Hopefully I've done my job so far and have, you know, made you confident and aware of the information so that you can make the best decision. And by the way, if you find yourself not signing that or whatever, call me, text me. I'm sure that we can work on something or I can answer any additional questions and then I'll send that out. Wow. And so um, just doing that in general is a good idea. But again, implementing an always, a sometimes, and a never will give you some more clarity on just really what to do next. I, I try to have more of a step-by-step process-driven approach to selling. And um, I found that being able to use an algorithmic approach to if this happens, then do this. I found it to give me a lot more organization and take a lot of the, I guess, guesswork out of selling. Yeah. I like that. An algorithmic approach. Wrote that one down. Give you a little, take that one to the bank. <laughs> algorithmic approach. Say that nine times fast, but it makes perfect sense, right? Like in a lot of times in businesses, you'll see this too, where like if the owner is the one selling, right? It's like, well, I just get on and I kind of like use my charisma and I kind of talk to them and then I figure out where it needs to go. That's very, very difficult to start duplicating when you need to scale or, or hire additional people, right? And by not having the same process, if I'm understanding you right, Jordan, it's like not only is it hard to duplicate, but it's also hard to figure out what actually works because if, you're, if your pitch is different every single way or every single time, you're not exactly sure like what was the thing that made those people close or how, how did I take them through that step? Um, talk to me, a, talk to me a little bit about scripts. Cause I know a lot of people hate scripts, right? They say, Oh, scripts make me sound scripted. Um, how, what's your approach with scripts? Cause I think it's great for training, but, uh, would love your, would love your take on, you know, how to use scripts, how, like, do we need to sound like a robot? Right. And when we're reading them, uh, cause a lot of people, when they do that, or maybe you're dyslexic like coach over here. And I'm like, you know, please don't ask me to read a script. Cause it's going to be awful. Right? I, I fuck. I was struggling getting through his bio and that was hard enough, right. On camera. So, uh, talk Talk to us about the scripts, man. Well, you did great on the bio reading. Fantastic. <laughs> you even improvised a little bit there with like the, the beer and cheese or whatever. But um, here's my take on scripts is I know that they suck. I'm not a huge fan of writing them. I'm not a huge fan of reading off of them. Uh, but until you can, until you know what you're doing, like you should probably have a script. <laughs> um, anybody out there that says that, having a script will make them sound too scripty is just a person that literally is making an excuse to not practice that script enough times to internalize that script, memorize that script and personalize that script. Mm. Um, you can give me your same script and I'll deliver it in its fullest. I've been doing this for 20 something years I know emphasis on words and tonality and these little nuances. Uh, but if you're out there and you're thinking that you sound too scripty, it's because you're still reading off the script. 
script. You should read off that script so many times that you don't need the script anymore, can still stick to the script while delivering your own personalized, you know, a vibrance to that script to make it really connect with the person that you're talking to. So we're building the scripts then more for training purposes, not like, hey, pick up the phone and read from this script, right? Right, right. I mean, initially, sure, you know, read off the script, do do the song and dance, understand some <laughs> of the nuances within the call that you're on or whatever. But, you know, the whole intention should be to use your mornings, use your nights, use your weekends to master that script so that sooner or later you can come in and you can become unconsciously competent. Mm. We're all familiar with that term. Yep. And I always tell people that you're not good at sales until it's the most boring thing that you can do all day. <laughs> if you're bored, that's when you're making money because you already know what's going to be said. You know what questions to ask. You know when you ask this question, you're going to get one of these three different responses. And if it's one of these three, then you can say that like it should just be boring where you pretty much know everything that could ever happen on that call and you make it a predictive process versus, oh, my God. Like they ask this question. It's like, you should know that they're going to ask that question already. In fact, put it in your script so they don't have to waste their time asking you. I like that. Yeah, that's always been one of my favorite things in sales is like take the objections and bake them back into your sales pitch. That way when the next guy comes along that has that same objection, you already hammered it out. And if you're doing your job as a salesperson, right, you get to the end of the pitch and you say, do you have any questions? And the answer should be no. It's like, nah, man, like. I can't think of one of question one a single question or objection that I would have. I, yep. I, I like that you said you said make it a predictive process. Uh, you know, rinse and repeat over and over and over. every every person's going to be different, but the process should still be pretty much the same every single time, right? Yeah, I'm. You know, there's. I'm at a point in I guess my professionalism or whatever my skill set where. I can kind of vary off of the script for a little bit, but I know where I'm at. I can always swing it right back in uh, depending on where the conversation goes. But yeah, you should, you should know that script. You should know that process. Um, you should know exactly where you're at because if you don't, then you're not really in control. If I'm driving my car down the freeway and all of a sudden I don't know where I am, <laughs> it's going to be really hard to figure out where I'm trying to get to. Hmm. <laughs> No Tesla driving in sales is my note I'm putting on that one. <laughs> That's right. Cool, man. Talk to us about uh, talk to us about the cash cards, man. If if people haven't heard about these, uh, I, I'd be curious. I know you guys have sold hundreds, maybe dozens. I don't know. I, I don't. I'm, I'm guessing, but like I see, I see people posting them all the time, uh, and and yeah. I know you've sold out multiple times and you've restocked, and so uh, that's that was pretty cool, man. It's almost like if you guys aren't familiar, these are basically like flashcards, right, for salespeople. Uh, talk yeah. talk to them about that, Jordan. Yeah. So uh, back in like 2020, I was staring out the window of the home office that I had put together in my house, <laughs> and I was just staring out the window. And I do this thing called thinking time every so often where I just write down like a high quality question and I'll just spend 20, 30 minutes uh, like meditating on the answers. Like yeah. just what are all the possible answers? And the question was, is how can I create a lead magnet that salespeople, business owners, my target audience, the people that I would like to work with uh, would find valuable enough to at the very least exchange their, you know, name, email address, and phone number with. And I was staring out the window and I had this idea. I was like, dude, objection flashcards. <laughs> so first thing I did, I went on Google, I typed it in and I was shocked. Nobody had ever created anything with an objection on one side and a response on the other. I did find some like blank cards, but like just go to Office Depot, buy your own you <laughs> index know, cards, right? index <laughs> cards and, and do it yourself. But then it's like the blind leading the blind, you know? So I immediately uh, put together, I think like 33 objections, wrote responses out, um, created some cards. I bought 25 of them. Uh, once they got delivered to my house, I unopened one and took a photo of it. It was like a selfie on Facebook. And I was basically just saying like, uh, I wish Hooked on Phonics would have included some of these you know, in the, in the math section. So like I could have at least made some money and um, I left a link to, you know, my little online store. I think they were like 25 bucks a deck at the time or whatever. 
And literally within like four or five minutes, all 25 decks were sold. And I was like, (laughs) that's pretty cool. So I ordered ordered 100 decks. And then I was like, back in stock. And uh, boom, same thing. In like 10 minutes, 100 decks sold. And I immediately knew that I had a a money-making product for myself. I was still waiting on feedback from other people. Um, you know, n- n- there's no sense in getting excited about creating a bad product. So yeah. <laughs> um, I waited a little bit. I personally called on these people not to upsell them or any, I just, did, the, did they work? Are they making you more money? Whatever, what can I do better? Yada, yada. I went back to the drawing board, uh, upgraded from 30 cards to 50 cards. And then, you know, literally started selling, started running ads. And uh, yeah, four years later, we've done a lot of upgrades, improvements. They come in a box now with cellophane and like the whole <laughs> song and dance. We even have their own cash card mailer that you get in the mailbox. Um, and yeah, to date, somewhere, you know, 2.2, 2.3 million dollars in sales, somewhere to the tune of 60, 70,000 decks in all 50 Jeez. states, 30, 39 countries worldwide. Like, who would have Insane. thought, man? Fucking flashcards. <laughs> flashcards, exactly. So, like, yeah, I mean, I, I can take some credit, I guess, for turning an idea and executing it um, and pat myself on the back for it. But, like, I always say, like, God gave me that idea. Like, that's just one of those random little beams of light where yep. you get that. So, I, you know, the real gem right there is, like, all of you guys get uh, ideas from from a higher place, whether it's God or, you know, whatever, I'm not here to change anybody's mind, but a lot of these things can be given to you. And if you just sit on them and don't do anything with them, what are you doing? Yeah, what man. are you doing? You got to, you got to execute. And if you don't know how to execute like me, you'll figure it out, you know, just take it a step at a time and uh, put it together. And uh, who knows, maybe you'll be the next person to get paid to actually generate leads. That's nuts, man. Yeah, because I was going to, I was like, interesting, you you thought of that. I wrote down lead magnet because I'm like, that thing, and I knew, like, I'm like, it's got to be more than a lead magnet now because I've seen Facebook ads and Instagram ads about the cards and whatnot. And so uh, I figured it was making you some money. Otherwise, you wouldn't have just kept pumping it as a legion like that, right? It's like, uh, so yeah. for you guys to be selling that many of them, dude, congratulations because I always say ideas are cute, execution gets paid. Uh, you know, anybody can have a, a cute little idea, but you took it, you ran with it, and you executed, and you got paid, man. And I also wrote down here uh, on my notes that there's no sense in getting excited about a bad product. I think that happens to business owners a lot, right? They have an idea, they're, like, super excited about it, and, like, it's going to change the world. They want to tell everybody, but then they either don't ever execute on it or they try to execute and it flops, and it's like you wasted a ton of effort and energy getting excited about something that never really had any legs. Yeah, um, yeah. Look- and, and if it flops, like, just humble yourself and figure out like what's missing about like it. A good idea is always a good idea. Sometimes the execution might lack or whatever, but you know, call customers, get, get the ugly out of them. You know, I I can't tell you how many people are like, the text is too small. These suck. I can't even read them. It's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll go make the text a little bit bigger so I can avoid this, you know, in the future or whatever. So, wow. um, yeah, just roll with it. You had and, a good feedback loop. Feedback. Yeah, yeah, and, you had a good and, feedback loop from your customers, it sounds like. Yeah, you and you, I'm, I love the praise. I love the five-star reviews and, you know, hey, these help me close a deal or whatever. Um, but before that product really matures and you really take it into market and spend 500 grand on ads like I have, you know, just look for the bad, bad news, you know, look for the, look for the, look for the comments that kind of piss you off or it's like, dude, I can't read these. These are garbage, you know? Mm. Okay. Hey man, these, these didn't come with a carrying case. I lost them all. My toddler, you know, threw one in the trash. What it's like, okay, I'll make a case for him. You know, it's, you just got to look for some of the bad feedback. So you know what type of changes to actually make. Wow. Good stuff, Jordan. I appreciate that, dude. That was, uh, 
all off the cash cards conversation. I, I was I was excited <laughs> to ask you about that. I didn't I didn't realize it had blown up into such a big product for you, man. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So so that's product. I, obviously, you're on a little e-commerce out of that, right? Like you had to learn how to <laughs> how to make a store, yeah. and I'm sure that's a lot different than your first iteration on there. What's maybe some takeaways? There's probably some people that are watching this that are in the e-com space. Like, what's some of the takeaways? Some of the mistakes or something that you can share that like you're like ah man this was an all that was I shouldn't have done that way or it was bad about sales. I'm big about saying that you you know a loss is never a loss uh, I'm sorry I say if you learn from your losses it's never a lose right so if you learn from your losses it's never a lose and so that's how you can keep stacking wins what's maybe some of those losses that you had that you learned from from the e-commerce side of things yeah um you know number one is just not knowing what you don't know like I did I didn't really quote. know how to manufacture I didn't know how to manufacture uh, like the little tuck box that the cards go into and, you know, I got a lot of bad feedback off that. They're like, dude, like, what am I supposed to do? Just put a rubber band around these? They're like, <laughs> it's like, that's valid. So um, that was kind of like, I wouldn't say necessarily mistakes. There's just automatically going to be some things that you don't know because you've never done it before. And you got to just, you got to accept that and, you know, make a commitment to improving. I will say if there's anything that I... Again, I wouldn't say it's a mistake. I would say it's more hindsight and a little bit of regret. But again, I didn't really know how important it would be because I never really thought the product would take off the way that it did. Uh, but I really wish I would have done a better job with customer segmentation. Um, what do you mean by in that? Other words, in other words, um, if uh, if Coach Carroll, you come in and I get you know DJ Carroll on an order and you have uh, three decks of cards... The only thing that that really might mean to me is that you might have a sales staff with three people, but I have, I really have no idea what business you're in, what your role is. Um, so all I was getting is just an order. And I can't tell you probably how many millions of dollars of additional services we could have provided if I could hit the right person with the right marketing, with the right email at the right time based on that customer segmentation. Oh. Um, I have a lot of friends these days uh, that have taken the journey from, you know, say $10 million a year to $50 million a year. And I always ask like, what's the difference, you know, 10 to 50. <laughs> They're like, it's really not much. When, when you get from like five to 10, you've got a lot of processes figured out, yada, yada. But the key from, from scaling is segmentation knowing how to remarket additional products and services to the right person at the right time uh, and communicating the right way. <laughs> Jordan putting you guys on game and you're not even realizing it. I hope you're taking notes. Because I'm telling you, the, the, the customer segmentation, you see this with Twilio and all these platforms that are coming out. They're like, customer segmentation. And listen, I mean, Andy's here with me. We've been on several calls with these types of platforms. And when we get to the end of their, their pitch, I'm like, so. So, like, what the fuck do you guys do? Right? Like, they, they have such a bad process of, like, selling it, how we can use it. What you just said there makes so much more sense. I, I, the reason why I hit you guys with the, the cash machine on that one was because that just broke some stuff loose for me. What Jordan is telling you is if he would have known that if DJ was a roofer versus a CPA, instead of yep. just sending out an email marketing campaign that says, hey, uh, does your sales team need sales training? If he knows I'm a roofer, the email says, hey, DJ, the way you can crush it in your roofing business next year are these three things, right? It's Now it's speaking a message directly to that person, um, which, again, we don't do a great job of. That's interesting, Jordan, that you said those guys that are scaling from $10 million to 100 or 10 to 50, they're saying, hey, it's just around the messaging to get that adaptation or adoption of their services. Um, shoo wee yeah. man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I have a I have a good friend of mine here in Milwaukee that is an absolute e-commerce expert. He sold uh, one of his e-com brands uh, for close to forty million dollars, and I was like, I get it. You had a great product, blah blah blah. But like, what was the thing? He was like, Oh, that's simple, man. Just extremely niche, um, unique messaging to the right person at a, in a, in the, at around the right time, you know. And if you can do that and you're speaking their language and you understand, you know, the little nuances and pain points and you can sell that easily and as easy as an email. 
Yeah. And so just email it to them and watch them buy. So wow. I would definitely say that that would be, again, not the, the biggest mistake in hindsight. It's kind of a mistake, but I didn't really know how important segmentation. Right. Would be. If you don't know, you don't know. That's, yeah. you know, that's uh, Jordan. If we're talking about customer segmentation, like what are some ideas? Like, do you think it's just more of a, like a client intake form or you get more data or like what could have you have done to improve that, to give you those data points? Yeah. Um, you know, I've thought about uh, it um, putting in different uh, fields that people can check out, obviously name, address, we're shipping stuff. Um, but, you know, even just um, voluntary fields about, you know, what's your role or title? And, you know, was this for yourself or your team? Something just as simple as that. What industry are you in? Um, that's all that I would really need to know based on role, title, you or your team and what industry you're in more than enough data for me to do a much better job of saying, oh, this guy's in marketing. Let's talk to them about marketing and sales versus do you want to get better at sales? It's like, yeah, I do. But like, marketing. do you work with reefers and insurance? <laughs> you know, like, the so, marketing guy's like, that. Ah, it's not my job. Like, and, you know, he opens that email. Or, or maybe your email doesn't even get opening because the subject line is specific to sales and not marketing, right? 100%. Um, Wow, man. Good stuff there. Thank you for sharing that with us. Holy smokes. Uh, and like just an extra quick piece of data, yeah, man. just just segmentation on like email lists. Uh, this is something I've done in the last couple of months. I was able to take my mass email list when I blast off a newsletter or whatever. I've been able to figure out ways to virtually create one newsletter, but deliver it with different subject lines. Um and I've been able to increase my open rates on email blasts from usually like eight, nine percent up to forty-three percent open rate across the board, across tens of thousands of email addresses. Just segmenting who are you and what's one thing that I can add that maybe you'll click on. And that's it. Is Jordan, is that something like putting their like like a merge tag, like their first name in the subject line, or is it, it something it, about like more information that you have further down the funnel? Yeah. So, um, to historically and retroactively combat the not knowingness of segmentation, I gave zoom info an oh, ungodly amount of money. They are expensive. <laughs> 54, $54,000 because of one reason I didn't, I mean, yeah, it'd be nice to get, more business owners, cell phone numbers, call them, whatever. But the main problem I was trying to solve for 54,000 is Zoom Info has an integration with HubSpot. And when a contact gets created inside of HubSpot, it takes their email address, phone number, name, all of the data I currently have and appends that data. And now I can see, oh, Coach Carroll, business owner, does about this much revenue, has about this many people on the team. And all of that info just seamlessly gets appended inside my CRM and allows me to, um, again, send a, a better wow. targeted email. Or if I'm going to make a phone call, instead of just giving you a super cold call about sales training, I could talk about, you know, hey, man, I wanted to just get your confirm your email address. I have a PDF of three things every marketing company needs to know about selling in 2024. You know, where can I send that to? It mm. just makes opening those doors so much easier because now you have a key. You're not just knocking. Wow. <laughs> third, third one, dude. We're on a roll. Oh, yeah. Well, I knew this was going to be good, man. I was. It wasn't like, you know, tell me about the first job you ever sold, Jordan. You know, it's like <laughs> I knew you were going to have data that you could share with us, and it, I knew it was going to be valuable, man, both to myself and the listeners. Like, the customer segmentation piece is huge, man. You know, we – with my exterior cleaning company, we do that with our Facebook ads. And when I made this change, I mean, I've been doing this before I even knew it was called customer segmentation, but it was like, you know, Oldham County residents, Jefferson County residents, right? Like, you know, or zip codes, right? People that live in the 40031 can now save $50 off exterior cleaning. When they see that ad, because it's only showing everybody in the 40031, it's like, oh, cool. And it's like they engage with that because it's speaking directly to them. You know, that's segmentation from a marketing standpoint. But, you know, yep. what you're sharing from a sales standpoint and deeper down the funnel and how much money you could have, you know, or you probably did leave on the table with all due respect, yeah. um, you know what I mean, yeah. by not being able to communicate effectively to those people, uh, that's a huge lesson, man. And, and 
it's always, uh, you know, when I started my senior year of high school, my first business, my audience knows this story by heart, uh, but the – the way that I kept track of everything was in one of those composition notebooks, right? And so, like, Mrs. Johnson gets mowed on Wednesday, right? And so, for, uh-huh. like, the first two and a half years, that was my CRM. That was all my data. And it's like, I have no idea where that thing is. Like, like my grandkids will probably find it when I kick the bucket one day. They'll be like, what is this from Grandpa? Uh, but, you know, that's the power of information and keeping a clean CRM and cle- keeping clean data points on your customers and your prospects, um, it's going to help you close more business. So appreciate you sharing that, man. I want to kind of shift gears a little bit. I know you've got quite a bit of experience in enterprise sales, right? I've, I'm, I'm pretty sure yes, in, a, in a past life, uh, again, I, I'm, I make sure I don't want to get you in trouble talking about things you're not allowed to talk about, but um, I'm pretty sure you closed a pretty big contract back in the day uh, with a major telecom company. Uh, and so I was curious maybe if you could share a little bit of information. I was wondering if you could share some information about that, about enterprise sales, because it's definitely a different beast than a, a B2B or a B2C. Uh, and we've definitely sure. got some people that are listening that are in that space. So um, any tips, tricks, hacks, if you can share the story about that, you know, about that a little bit. Uh, if not, yeah. that's totally fine. But I want to turn yeah. that over to you because I, I, you shared that story with me before. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, back in the day, Grant Cardone's office, I closed what I believe probably still is the biggest deal in the history of that, their training organization. I closed a, uh, a $1.7 million deal with Sprint Wireless. Uh, it took me two and a half years. And, uh, at the time at, at that office in that sales role, all I was doing was B2B, uh, very little B2C. Um, so I'm just calling business owners, um, do you have a sales team setting an appointment to look at the product, doing the sales pitch, doing the follow-up, creating the relationship, uh, to the close. And so basically, um, I was on Periscope one night. Oh, Periscope. And, yeah. If y'all, if y'all remember <laughs> Periscope, I was on Periscope and, uh, some dude commented like his email address and said, like, I'm a, a manager at Sprint or something. And I was like, I'll shoot him an email. No idea. Uh, turns out that he was a, uh, a Wisconsinite and he was like, hold up, hold up. Is that, is that what you guys are called with Wisconsinites or did you Wisconsin just make that Knights. shit? Up? No, that's yeah, like no. the cool, like an Indiana Hoosier, a Kentucky hillbilly. You guys are Wisconsinites. Wisconsinites. Baby. That sounds like a, yeah. like a Knights of the round table, like the highest level of knighthood that you could become. <laughs> like, she's okay. Sorry. Back, back I mean, to it. That, that's, I'd never heard that before. That was pretty, a Wisconsinite. All right. Well, well now, you know, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, it turns out he was based in Wisconsin and was a significant high role in, uh, in sprint and had all the connections. So I flew up to Wisconsin. We met at a brewery. Duh. <laughs> Um, and I formed a relationship with this guy, Russell and, uh, Russell liked me enough where he's like, okay, you know, I'll get your foot in the door with, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin and, um, Indiana. I'm like, okay, cool. So we ran a a pilot program, which you do for free. And, uh, you know, I'm getting a bunch of, you know, shit talking at the office. Oh, dude, you couldn't even close them. You had to give it to them for free. You're, that wasn't a sell, Jordan, you went and laid down. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Like, dude, you flew up there and, and walked home with no money. Like, you're weak, bro. You're weak. <laughs> and, like, nobody knows, like, how long the play is. Like, I'm not trying to acquire Wisconsin, Indiana, and uh, and Illinois. I'm trying to blow this thing up. This is a, a massive company. Um, so, fast forward a while. You know, the pilot program did really well. I flew up to Illinois a bunch of times. Started facilitating a lot of the training. And what I learned is, and this is probably for all businesses, like large enterprise corporations, but um, probably pretty similar. Sprint loved Twitter. Mm. That was the place where all the executives were all the way up, the whole way up from salesperson to store manager to district manager to, you know, uh, the person that overlooks them all the way up to the like all the way up to the CEO, Marcelo Clure at the time. And so um, I just started getting on Twitter and I literally would walk into stores in Aventura and in Coral Springs and Brickell and Miami all over. I'd just walk into a store and say, hey, my name is Jordan. 
uh, can I run a free sales meeting for your team? And the store manager would be like, sure, go for it, dude. <laughs> so they, they would gather like three teenagers and like, I would start talking about, you know, objections and TEP, which was like their insurance add on when you buy the phone, blah, blah, blah. And uh, little by little, these people started taking photos of me and then they would tag their district manager and the regional president. Hey man, this guy, Jordan just bounced in sick present. Like we sold more yesterday because of him than we, you know, whatever. And so I started identifying who the players are. And, you know, two years later, I literally, I believe talked to every single, there were 16 regional presidents that have their own decision-making power. They run their own billion dollar company. And if you want to get the the whole state of Florida, you got to find and become friends with and build some trust with the regional president. And so um, we finally got to meet countless hours of preparation and yada, yada. And I went into his office and we were finally time to get the whole state of Florida, 12, 1300 employees. And I walked in there with a, a deal for 1.7. And uh, I was 29 years old at the time. I sat down in this guy's office. He's like literally like from the Latin billionaire boys club, like <laughs> stories of racing cars in the deserts of Dubai and like has a car collection down in Chile and just hyper successful people, you know, at, at the top. And I sit down and I slide over the deal. And I'm like, let's do this. And he busts out like a little whiteboard and he's like did you go to college and i was like i dropped out he's like let me give you a lesson on economics i'm like oh shit okay <laughs> so he draws like this graph and you know this the top axis is money and the other one is like number of units or whatever and he's like if you were selling me hot dogs and he just drew a, a linear line he's like the more hot dogs that we buy the more money you're gonna make because we're ordering more hot dogs but with a software product, it's more like stairs because sure, there's some cost maybe for the 1200 users, but then there's no additional cost. They already have a username, password. They can log in. They can check out this product. So here's what I'll do. I will buy your product as is, like you mentioned, all the deliverables and everything, and I'll, I'll overprice it and I'll, I'll sign for 400,000. So $1.3 million less than what I was looking for. And that is the day... Not that I became a sales professional, but that was the day that I learned true value of what you're selling. And this is very important for everybody to listen to. Mm. I finally kind of like grabbed my stones, if you will. And <laughs> I was like, you're right. And truth is I can give you usernames and passwords for $0, but no meetings from me, no personal content, no running around and talking to you. I'm not going to answer the phone when you call. I, I, you, you remove me from the deal. So you can pay 400 K for this, but I cost 1.3. What do you want to do? <laughs> and I left it there for, it could have been five seconds. It felt like 20 minutes of me just. <laughs> yeah. Whoever talks first loses. Say, dude? <laughs> and then he laughed and he was like, yeah. Okay. And we signed and uh, he signed that deal on Halloween, October 31st, 2016. And here's another just quick little sales and B2B lesson for you guys. Acquiring this deal put me at the bonus tier of annual production. So the annual quota to reach this annual bonus was 200, or, sorry, $2 million worth of production. I had eclipsed that with this deal, but... I needed money in on the deal. So I had the signed contract. That's not good enough. I need the first month's payment. I looked at the sprint contract and they have a net 60 term. Oh. If you're unfamiliar with that, what that means, oh. I mean, when you send them an invoice, they like by law or whatever, have 60 days to pay that first invoice. And uh, if you guys know anything about holidays, Q4, end of the year, and just working big deals anyway, Net 60 on November 1st guarantees I'm not going to get that check. Till middle until middle January. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So here's the, here's what was on the line for me. I had an 8% retroactive bonus on $2 million. If any of you guys wow. want to grab a calculator, 
that is $188,000 bonus above and beyond my commissions that I was trying to get. So here's the lesson is I got the deal, but now I needed to get paid. And so I literally called up Claudio. He was the regional president. And I said, look, man, I appreciate you signing that deal, bro. I feel really good about this and I appreciate it, but there's a problem. He's like, what's the problem, dude? You just signed the biggest deal of your life and we gave you exactly what, what's the deal. I was like, look, dude, um, you like cars, right? He's like, dude, I love cars. I'm like, I really like cars too. And I, I really want a Porsche 911 brand new. It's been a dream of mine since I was four. He's like, okay, so like, why don't you go buy one? I was like, I mean, I could, but like, I kind of have it tied to like getting this bonus. And I'll be honest with you. I have $188,000 on the line. He's like, holy shit. <laughs> I was like, all I need is I just need one check to come in before whatever it was, December 30th, I think it was that year at like seven o'clock, like anything you can do to get that done. He's like, I don't know. I'm not in charge of, you know, writing the checks over here. I just literally sign for stuff. And then there's another department, but like, let me make a call. November goes by, I get nothing. Most of December goes by, I go home to Wisconsin to celebrate Christmas. I come home on the 27th, literally on December 28th, I got a check for, I think it was whatever the first $54,000 or whatever on the deal. And I ended up going to Cancun and that's when on whatever, December 30th or whatever, I got a check for $188,000 uh, as a wow. bonus. And the lesson is, is that all you have to do in business to business deals is help other people, one, look good when they make a decision. There's always going to be a level of scrutiny, no matter if you sell to the CEO, the v the VP and the president and the managers are all going to be pissed off because, oh, you did this or whatever. Make that person look like a rock star. Obviously, if the VP is making a decision, make them look, crush it. But also, let people know what's in it for you. Mm. I am a, I'm a subscriber to the idea that most people are good and would be willing to help me, you know, if I need help. And so some of you guys aren't really capitalizing on as many opportunities as you could because you haven't made it abundantly clear to your customers how doing a deal affects you. Wow. People will do, people will expedite checks and sign things literally all just because of you. So the main lesson about B2B is you're not necessarily selling a product or service. You're selling a relationship that you build. Uh, you're showing that person how to become more valuable. Uh, you're showing them how to become a rock star and you're giving them the opportunity to help you. In which case a lot of boxes gets checked there and it creates a lot of perceived urgency and value that doesn't really exist in the exchange of you give me money, I give you this product. So, um, wow, yeah, it was an epic story. Yeah, yeah, take that one to the bank. We're gonna give you a little applause on that one, dude. That's oh, hey, that was that was better than the first time you told that to me. I didn't get all those details the first time around. That's uh, that's great. So, well, what was it one, this one is recorded? Yeah, it's what 1.7. Uh, what it was like a multi year deal? Like, obviously, you said like first payment comes in, it's 54. Like, so it was like spread out over monthly payments, like multi, multi year yep. contract. Yeah, a long contract. Um, I think it was 18 months or something. And then uh, there were some additional payments that were going to be due, but that was kind of like the the base monthly subscription or whatever that wow. was. Wow, that's killer, dude. That's killer. Shoo, boy. I hope you guys took notes on that one because that's uh, that's powerful stuff, man. The, the ability to have the kahunas to walk in there and just say, ink the deal and when he I mean because Jordan like let's like retroactively like if we're looking back you could have just as easily been like okay man 400 is all you guys are going to give me like cool that's it and then you've been busting your stones for 400 grand versus 1.7 right but because you yeah. planted your flag you you dug your hills in and you fought for it the guy was like cool right I mean like you sold him versus him selling you man that's uh, it I love that, dude. That's awesome. And, you know, I, I like the other big takeaway, uh, help people look good uh, whenever whenever you're doing these these enterprise deals. And it, and it's a long sell. So what do you think, Jordan, from the time that dude signs that paper all the way back from the dude on Periscope, like what's that timeline look like? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 
two to two and a half years. Wow. Work, worked for free, spent thousands of my own dollars flying to Kansas City and California and Texas to meet with all these regional presidents um, and doing it all for free and understanding that there's a reasonable chance that you'll never get paid and never land this deal. Um, right. I would say that another lesson from that lesson is if you, if you believe it, dude, you can achieve it. Like mm. how many times do you need to be told that for you to really live it? <laughs> They've been telling you know? us that since second grade. <laughs> right. And, and uh, a lot of you too out there, you might be limiting the amount of money you can make by not necessarily being selfish, but like work for free. You know, I, to this day, dude, I did a free sales meeting a couple hours ago for a company that's like, oh, I don't know if we want to do this training contract with Stupar. I'm like, dude, let me get in front of your team for free. I'm sure that th you'll be able to get some feedback and know whether this is a good fit or not. And uh, I'm not above, you know, working for free or even paying to play. Sometimes I'll fly out to a business on my own dime, put myself in a hotel, yada, yada, on the off chance that maybe they never sign. But yeah. if you bring value you kind of put people in debt. That's kind of what I've learned. Is yeah, man. If you can bring enough value and make people feel like they're in debt, then it's probably likely that they'll find some type of way to repay you for that debt. Yeah, it's a law of reciprocity. It works, man. Um, it does. You know, and the pay-to-play, I'm big on the pay-to-play. In a couple of weeks, I'm speaking out in Vegas at a conference. It costs us twelve grand to be a partner with that, but the dude's a huge referral partner for us. We do a ton of business with that guy. So I'm more than happy to slip a little cheddar in his pocket uh, to keep, you know, getting put up on the podium, so to speak, in, in, front, of his, uh, in front of his audience. So, uh, you know, I think sometimes business owners – you know, I like that saying, you, you're tripping over hundreds to pick up tens, right? Like they're, they're afraid to spend a little bit of money to go after the big money. So that's it. Dude, this has been great. We talked about micro processes. We talked about lead magnets with your cash cards. We talked e -com. We talked enterprise sales. Jordan, how can people find you? Say they want to get the cash cards. Let's plug that. And then how can they find you online, dude? I'd love for my audience to go out and connect with you. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for cash cards, uh, you can go to jordanstupar.com. If you want to connect with me, you go to jordanstupar.com, uh, or you can just literally Google cash cards, Jordan Stupar. That's cool. I'm going to be, I'll be at the top. Um, if you want to connect with me on social media, I am pretty much everywhere at Jordan Stupar. Um, I'm everywhere except for Snapchat. I don't think that's really an appropriate app for adults, but you know, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I'm out there and I'm uh, very accessible and I'm very approachable. If any of you guys are interested in talking sales, business, whatever, um, like I said, I'll, my intention is to bring you value and I would never sell you anything you don't want to buy. Yeah, man, you, you've you always been, I'm, I, I'd have to go back and look at our messages. I, I mean, 20, I think we first connected even when you were still at Grant's office. So it's like, I've known you a long time. It's been so fun watching your journey. You've always been nothing but professional. You know, we're working a, we're working a potential deal right now and uh, with you guys. And, you know, I've had other coaches, other people that I've started to do business with, right? Something, it's just not right. It's just not good timing, right? Sometimes it's not good timing and then I've had those people blow up and you know then it's like name calling and they get petty and it's like that's not how you do business man it's not how you win long term uh you've always been super professional and super approachable so guys if you're listening to this I highly recommend you go out check out Jordan you've got tons of videos tons of content out there too man that, that they they can learn from so uh Jordan a doubt. I appreciate you being on the sales factory podcast guys if you're watching this on YouTube make sure you hit the subscribe button the like button leave us a comment let me know what you think and if you're watching this on the major podcast platforms make sure you get subscribed and leave us a review it helps us reach more people so we can help them further their journey uh with that being said we'll wrap up this episode here's to your guys's success hustle it's worth it <laughs>